What's going on, y'all? It's your boy Snoop with another episode of Open Bar. So before we get into today's topic, make sure y'all like, share, and subscribe. All right, so for today's episode, I was I took to Instagram again and I asked people what questions they would like me to answer on this episode and I got a lot of training questions. So I figured I put all the training questions into one episode and I got a lot of dope questions. So the first question was key factors when training to compete, right? This is a great question because me as a coach, I do feel a lot of athletes, they don't even prepare properly for whatever competition. They just feel, oh, I'm in shape, I'm fit. So when I get there, I'm gonna just go crazy. And then they hit a wall. They hit a wall because a lot of these, you know, in my personal opinion, preparation is always it helps with your confidence, it helps with your performance. Whenever you're on a stage, you want to give the, your best foot forward. So, you know, the number one thing I would say is learn the rules. When I was competing, whenever I compete, whoever is hosting, um, I ask them a million questions. Form standard, even on game day when you're there, you know, understand the bar whether it's, you know, like I said, each bar is different. You have skinny pull-up bars, you have wider dip bars. Push-ups can either be on the floor or on a bar. Burpees might be, you know, some burpees, they might not, they, they, they might not want you to make your belly touch the ground, etc. So ask all of these questions pertaining to the movements that are involved in the competition. Um, that's number one. And two, train it train it train it like crazy I, I tell I always tell my team that the competition you should be so tired of this routine that you can't wait till the competition comes so you don't got to do it again you know run it into the ground to the point where like you said your, your hardest runs at a set should be in training it should be in practice the um, game day you should be able to run that like crazy whenever you're like, you know, you'd be able to finish it and do it again if asked to because you've ran it so many times. And most importantly, when you're training to compete, you know, experience is the best teacher. So, you know, I advise if you're battling, if, if you're training for a battle to battle, you know, spar against a friend, a teammate, you know, just uh, like random, like whoever you have access to. When you're training for a competition, like you said, if, if you don't have access to a person, time is always a, a, a nasty competitor. You know what I'm saying? That's what the five minute drill was. You're trying to do 50 and 100 in five minutes. You're not trying to just see how long it takes you. You're trying to get it in five minutes. And then once you beat that level, all right, let's try it in four minutes. Let's try it in three. You know what I'm saying? So if you don't, you know, when you're running a set, if you don't, if you're just running it by yourself, I advise you to time, to time it, gauge your rest periods, gauge, you know, how long it takes you to do the set, gauge which parts of the set kind of, you know, cripple you or yeah, the, these pulls were killing me or these push-ups killed me and, you know, target that, emphasize that in your training. All right, here's the second. The second question I received was, hey Snoop, do you see any value in practicing single limb exercises like one arm push-ups, pistol squats, etc.? That is a great question. And the first thing that comes to my mind is it depends on your age. That's a young man's game, in my personal opinion. Um, as far as the pressure you're putting on the joints and etc. Um, now that I'm older, and this is something that I learned from my big homies, is, you know, it, it's not worth it when you get to a certain age. Um, but I do think there are benefits to it because, like I said, it, it is a, a strength level. It is a mental comfort because, you, you know, when you have, and it's control, and to me, that's the definition of strength, it's control. So being able to do something in one arm is a level of control, you know, because you're not doing it sloppy. You can't, you're putting all your pressure on one arm. You're putting all your pressure on one leg. You, you have to control your whole body weight. And to me, that gives you a mental strength of like, yo, if I could do this with one arm, imagine what I could do with both. 
you know. Um, it was never really a preference in my training. I was able to do it and I would do it occasionally. You know, it was one of those things like, yo, let me see if I can do it. But I never emphasized on it because I don't like how I don't like the strain I feel from it. And like I said, I, um, I, I got a little too old to, to do it regularly and repeatedly. But I do think they are benefits. And like I said, the cons to it is, like I said, it is a lot of pressure. Um, I do remember specifically one time I was doing one arm pulls and, you know, putting all that pressure on one arm, you know, it really strained a muscle and I was hurt for a while. And I'm, I'm honestly, I think that's probably one of the mental blocks that made me never go back to it because it was just awesome. Like, nah, I'm cool. Like that, that was not worth the risk, but you know, the cons of it, but I do think progressively you can train to that because I've seen some guys do amazing things. Um, example, I've seen a guy do 26 one arm pulls in a minute. And to me, that is insane. You know, and that comes from mastering the craft, you know what I'm saying? Training it. So my experience is, isn't always everyone's experience. It's, you know, it, it, it varies depending on the person, the athlete. But when people ask me, do I recommend it? You know, I, the first thing I say is, how old are you? And then it goes back to my, my basic question of training in general. Whenever someone comes to me with the training, the first thing I ask them is, why do you want to train? Why? Because the, the why determines how you train. So are you training just to be fit? Are you training to lose weight? Are you training to be a competitor? Are you, like These are the key factors to how you train. So that goes into my, the third question now. How do I stay on a routine and stick with it for beginners and how do I approach it? Beginners, that is the, something that we all can relate to. You know, no matter what athlete you name, they were a beginner at one point. The, the, the biggest thing that I tell any beginner that I start with is survive the first two weeks. You survive the first two weeks because that, that is when the soreness is real. That's when the shock of like, yo, what the hell is going on <laughs> happens, you know, like, you know, you, you, you might catch cramps in your sleep. Your body is just like, well, we've never done this before. What's going on? You might throw up. You might do the whole nine. But once you survive that two week mark, it your body learns and adapts. That's number one. And number two is just really the discipline, the willpower. Like I said, um, you, you really have to dig deep of why you want to do this. A lot of people do it for vain reasons. And to be honest, I'm not here to judge anyone, but if your reasons are vain, it has to be strong. You know what I'm saying? Like you have to be so in love with the attention you get from having a good body that that fuels you to work out every day. You, you understand? So. Whatever your reason is, and like you said, it's not something that you speak publicly, it's a private conversation you have with yourself. Um, I'll open up. My personal reason for training is, especially, I, I love being able to do. From young, you know, climbing fences, jumping, playing basketball, playing football, I like to always be capable of doing these things, and that requires you to be athletic. So, like I said, like I do feel, especially now that I'm close to 40, I'm 39 years old, I can still play basketball with my kid. I can still, I feel, you know, so energetic and youthful. And that is my drive now. It's not so much competing anymore. I've had that phase. Um, I still compete in different ways. You know, I coach um, and I train competitors. So, you know, it's from a seasoned competitive mind. But that is one of my main motivations. So, you know, for some people, you know, like I said, like right now, my son is 12 and my daughter is seven. And, you know, in my mind, when they turn 20, when they turn 30, because my parents are in their 70s and they're still able, they still, you know, swim and squat and play sports and et cetera. And to me, that is longevity of life. And that is something that I aspire to be as well. And it's something that 
you know, I essentially want to pass on to my children. So, you know, when you get into training, when you're in that beginner phase, when you're in that phase of like, yo, why am I even doing this? It's not worth it. It's so much easier to just lounge and continue doing what I'm doing. You have to understand that if you survive these two weeks, once you make this a routine and a lifestyle, that that is what's going to make you continue. And like I said, I, what I tell my beginners all the time is it doesn't happen overnight. You know, I recommend people to train out, train maybe three days a week, three to four days, you know, um, just to build a habit, just to notice the small changes and small changes isn't always on the scale. Sometimes it's your energy. It's, um, you know, how you wake up. Little things like, oh, when I walk up the stairs, I'm not out of breath anymore. You know what I'm saying? Like those little changes. And then when you hit that level, it's just awesome. Like, all right, well, what's next? You know what I'm saying? I, I do got summer is coming up. I want to walk around and, you know, look and write. So let me let me add another day or let me add intensity to my workouts. That's why, you know, shameless plug. That's why I offer my services to write workouts, to to do personal coaching along with personal training. Because, you know, that is a common problem I see in a lot of people where they just don't, you know, they need the drive. That is the benefits of being part of a community and part of a team and leading a team is that you have constant accountability around you and constant motivation. That's why most people feel more comfortable when they when they start off. They like to go with a friend, a sibling, a relative, a gym partner per se, because, you know, it's, it's always better to die with company. When you die by yourself, it's just awesome. Like, yeah, this ain't worth it. I'm out. All right. So now let's get into the fourth question. We're only doing five questions for this episode. Building sensible routine programs. Again, it goes to the question of why are you doing this? Like I said, some people just want to be fit. So, you know, you don't have to limit yourself to a form standard, to a full lockout, to a, you know, because I personally think that lower range of motion gives you a better aesthetic. Like I said, if you want to emphasize the arms for push-ups, you, you stay in this range. You don't need to, to, to lock out. You get to stay in that middle area. So, you know, if you're training for competition, I would advise training full range of motion simply because. Let me rephrase that. I always recommend full range of motion, but a lot of people aren't interested in it. But full range of motion makes every other range of motion so easy. Then why not train it? Why not do the hardest one? Like I said, I, I was raised where if I'm playing a video game, I'm playing on hard, not normal. Because if I can survive on hard, when I play on normal, it's a breeze. So I approach the training like that. So if you practice full range of motion, shorter range becomes nothing. And then guess what? You can mix the two. You can meet in both ends. So like I said, you come down to what you want out of your training. And like you said, if you want the aesthetic, you train a lot of, you know, isos or, um, things that keep the tension on the muscle short range of motion if you want to get into com competing you do long range of motion if you just want cardio you know heavy with the burpees and the endurance work and the squats if you just want an aesthetic you if you just want strength you focus on weighted and lower reps so like i said it still comes down to what you want out of your training and like i said like real talk a lot of people just go into it and just do a little bit of everything and I recommend that as well, because that's how I learned these lessons. I tried everything and I kind of like, OK, I like how my body looks when I was doing this. So let me add this a little more because the wife started giving me a little more play. You know what I'm saying? Let me um, with this, like, all right, like doing that, my endurance is off the chain. Like I don't get tired anymore. I can like, et cetera. So, you know, like trial and error is always the best, but just do it smart, do it educated don't just jump into something i don't like i said don't go trying something you just saw on youtube you know be mindful of what your skill level is um like i said that's where it comes down to a coach to help guide you to use that outside eye and last but not least what are five exercise workouts that i recommend every person should do no equipment this is probably one of the best questions that 
a lot of people should ask, but me getting into calisthenics, I've done calisthenics my whole life. You know, as a basketball player, they would make us warm up with a lot of push-ups, slight pull-ups, burpees, and um, squats. And when I did my very first competition, Pup J, or it, it was formerly called Five Bs, right? And the Five Bs stood for body built beautifully by the bar. And I thought that was so dope. And the five movements of this competition were pull-ups, push-ups, dips, squats, and pull-ups, push-ups, dips, squats, and sit-ups. Those were the five movements. And obviously those can be weighted, but is not necessarily being weighted. And why I recommend these movements, because besides my go-to movements are always push-ups, squats. I wouldn't say sit-ups. I'm not really a fan of sit-ups. Um, I, I more train plank or core movements, so something with core. But I'm, I, um, these three movements don't require any equipment. It is just require a floor. So there's never an excuse with a push-up, a plank, or a squat. You know, dips and pull-ups obviously require uh, some type of bar. And, you know, those are, those are movements that, like you said, you can buy equipment to do. But these are the five movements that I absolutely recommend. And like I said, the, like to be honest, like I can do a, a two-hour workout of just push-up. You know, there's so many variations, there's so many different styles, so much combination, so much ways to blend them together that these five movements are all you need. And the beautiful thing about calisthenics that I want to end this episode on that all of fitness can agree on is calisthenics is the foundation of all fitness movements weightlifting, powerlifting, all of that stuff, you know, it started off with someone trying to do push-ups and stuff. So mastering these basics, excelling at these basics makes any movement easier. And I vouch by that. Like I said, I will train, I've trained with people in other forms of fitness and I may not be as good at what you do because, you know, you have put in more hours in this at me, but I can do it. You know what I'm saying? And when the tables are turned, when you have to come into our world, you struggle to adapt. So that does to me click like calisthenics is the best foundation. So like I said, that's that's all the questions today. Um, as usual, I absolutely would like to see a lot of comments. I would like to see a lot of feedback and interaction. You know, ask more questions, DM me on Instagram so I can bring more of these Open topics bar. to you. So once again, that's another episode of Open Bar, Coach Caps. Open Bar. Open Bar. Open Bar.